ancient city heavily charged with history, spirituality, and a rare oasis of religious diversity. Jerusalem is a special place, but also one of controversy. Today, the status of Jerusalem remains one of the core issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel refers to Jerusalem as the country's undivided capital, where the Israeli parliament, government and Supreme Court are located. However, Palestinians see East Jerusalem as their territory, the home of the sacred Al-Aqsa Mosque occupied by Israel. In the past few months, a new round of violence in the capital captivated media headlines. More than 20 people have been killed in almost 150 terror attacks, stabbings, shootings and vehicular rammings. Some say the recent series of attacks against Israelis is the direct result of incitement by radical Islamist and terrorist elements, calling on Palestinian youth to murder Jews. For decades, the melting pot of Jerusalem has stood at the center of the conflict, but thus far, no political intervention has calmed tensions. Some want peace, others say violence is the only answer. But one thing is certain, Jerusalem will forever be a center of religious history for Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Our focus this week is on Jerusalem. Hello and welcome to our weekly focus. I am Tal Heinrich. This time, we decided to take you out of the studio to the city which many people from different religions refer to as the heart of the world. But this heart that is constantly beating seems to be bleeding non-stop lately. Since the outset of the latest round of violence in Israel, we have been witnessing 88 stabbing attacks, 32 shootings and 14 car rammings. With me here is Mohammed Al Qasem, I-24 News Middle East reporter. Thank you for joining us. Mohammed, um, Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the city holy to three religions, has been on a high terror alert recently. What has been the discourse regarding this round of violence on the Palestinian street? Tell the Palestinian basically sum up the reasons into three reasons. The first one, they feel that Israel is trying to change the status quo at Al-Aqsa Mosque. And Al-Aqsa Mosque, as you know, is the third holiest mosque for Muslims. So they feel that Israel is trying to change the status quo. That's one. The second reason is basically they're saying that the occupation must end. And without an end to the occupation, the Palestinian will continue to rise up to the Israelis. And thirdly, and I think that's the most important reason uh, that is really impacting Palestinians, that they are not afforded the same services in Palestinian uh, neighborhoods here in the city. Palestinians uh, tell us that they, they pay taxes to a uh, municipality of Jerusalem, but they are not giving the, given the same services, basic services such as garbage collections, electricity and water as Jewish residents of the city get. Muhammad, I know that you have been filling the ground lately in places like Ramallah and Hebron and East Jerusalem, and you've been speaking to young Palestinians as well. And this, in this latest round of terror, we have been witnessing very young Palestinians carrying out such terrible attacks. What goes through their minds? Well, this is the, the, the generation that's been dubbed as the Oslo generation. These, the majority of these uh, young Palestinian men and women were born post-1994, uh, after the Oslo Accord, and they tell us that they are frustrated, they are fed up with the lack of uh, progress in the peace process. They're saying that there is high unemployment, there is no future for them once they get out of school or even the university. There is, there is not much financial or uh, future security for them. So they have they lost uh, faith in the Palestinian Authority as well as in the peace process and in the Israeli government trying to reach some kind of an end to the status quo or stalemate in the, in the peace prayer process. And I want to ask you, because we hear many, many people saying that this violence is a new reality that Israelis will now have to adjust to. But I want to ask you, um, do you think that this may be the start of something bigger or does it seem to dwindle out? It, it looks like just by monitoring the situation the last few few weeks that things are dwindling out. People are, get, you know, whether it's Palestinians or uh, Jewish residents of the city, getting back to their normal life. But I must say, Tal, that there is not only this uh, divide among residents and neighborhoods of the city, physical divide between the cement cubes or uh, walls dividing neighborhoods adjacent to each other, or the security fences. We're talking about emotional and psychological divide that is will take many, many, many years if, uh, before it's healed. So the city may be unified uh, for, to politicians, but it's divided among people who live uh, in it. Thank you so much for this, Mohammed. My pleasure. 
rare symbol of coexistence here in Jerusalem is the Arab Hebrew bilingual school. In November 2014, young Jewish extremists set fire to the school. They also damaged a first grade classroom with slogans in Hebrew saying there is no coexistence with cancer. A few weeks ago, one of them was sentenced to three years in prison. With us here is Fadi Swidan. You are a father of two, two children that go daily to the school, right? Yes, indeed. Um, now, in one year perspective, what has changed since that arson? We became a stronger society in the school. I mean, we had to go a few very difficult days in the beginning and to just rely on each other to go on and go past what happened, pass it through together. And, in a way, it just combined us more and combined our powers to become more unified against mm -hmm. what happened here. Explain to us, how does the system work? What is the bilingual school? Actually, bilingual school is uh, it's a system that fights the segregation that's, and the separation that's going on outside these walls of these schools. We have children, both Arabs and Jews, coming here to the school, having two teachers at the same time, one Arab, one Jewish, and uh, being taught in the two languages when the teachers do not translate each other. They just speak in each, each other's own narrative. So what are the tools, in your opinion, that this school provides your kids once they graduate? I mean, we give them the ability to listen to languages and to understand each other, to understand cultures, to understand the other religion, to be able to celebrate the other religion to be uh, hospitable to other religions and to ethnicities and to cultures. And being able to speak the other language is also being able to understand it and uh, all that's around it. Sounds like a small miracle that is happening here. Well, it's, our day to, it's our daily life and for us, you know, it's our routine and we just want to go out and spread it. Fadi Swidan, thank you so much for this interview. Thank you. And now let's see what else is going on in Jerusalem. Israel and the United States successfully tested a ballistic missile interceptor as Jerusalem seeks to upgrade its defenses in the face of regional threats. The trial from an Israeli test range involved the Arrow 3 interceptor designed to shoot down missiles above the atmosphere, with Israel concerned over potential for attacks from enemies including Iran. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with German President Joachim Gok, who was visiting Israel for the conclusion of events marking 50 years since the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Germany. The Prime Minister stressed the uniqueness of the bilateral relationship, which is characterized by a tragic past alongside a constant view towards the future. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's recently adopted dog, Kaya, has sunk her teeth into her new position, biting two visitors at a Jerusalem event, including the husband of, including the, husband of the deputy foreign minister. At a candlelighting ceremony to mark the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, the 10-year-old mixed breed also took a snip at a member of parliament from Netanyahu's Likud party. American television personality Ruth Westheimer, more commonly known as Dr. Ruth, spoke in Jerusalem at an event for the Jewish Film Festival. The 87-year-old sex therapist's talk was a look at cinema and its relationship with sexuality and intimacy in the 20th and 21st century. All over the world, including in Jerusalem, Jews celebrated Hanukkah last week, also known as the Festival of Lights, a Jewish holiday observed for eight nights and days out of the year. It is customary during the holiday for Jews to light a candelabra each night of the eight-day-long annual event. Throughout the years, many archaeological findings were discovered in Jerusalem, shedding more and more light on the rich history of the city. Recently, a 2,700-year-old seal impression bearing the name of Bible-era King Hezekiah had been discovered in excavations by the Temple Mount. And this comes after another very important discovery of a fortress constructed more than 2,000 years ago by King Antiochus Epiphanes. Joining us now is Amit Ram, Jerusalem District Archaeologist on behalf of the Israel Antiquities Authority. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, where are we standing now? You chose to bring us here to the Kishle, close by the Fortress of David. Tal, this is an unknown place. This is a secret, known by the name the Kishle. It's near Jaffa Gate. 
And in this place, this is the place of silence. silence. Mm -hmm. It's an underground place. This is the playground of the archaeologists. And in here, more than 10 years, I and my team in the Israeli Antiquity Authority find remains from the first temple period. For example, the fortification dating to the time of Hezekiah the king. And above it, we find uh, the fortification of Jerusalem from the time of the Osmonian, the Maccabean. And above it, we find the remains of the palace of the King Herod palace. And above it, we find jail from the British mandate. So actually, this is our playground. This is the place of archaeologists. This is the a story of Jerusalem, layer upon layer, remains upon remains. This is the magic of Jerusalem. And what is the significance of all these latest discoveries that we mentioned before? You know what? The last year have been very productive and very successful to the archaeology of Jerusalem. Let's say you, ho you uh, everybody heard about the discovering of the Chakra, uh, the Greek fortress in Jerusalem in the second century BC. And another important find, we find an inscription near Damascus the, uh, gate, mentioning the emperor, the famous Roman emperor, uh, Adrianus. Uh, these remain, we are revealing ancient Jerusalem. It's becoming alive from the ashes, from the ground. And every piece of knowledge joining to this huge and amazing puzzle of researching ancient Jerusalem. And tell us a bit about your work here. How special is it for you as an archaeologist to work in Jerusalem? Tal, it's a way of life. It's a privilege. It's a quest. Believe me, I'm saying to you that I'm waiting to wake up every morning and come to work and come to job. Every day, it's a new day with new discoveries. I'm walking here in Jerusalem more than 20 years. And you know what? I know nothing. Every day, it's full of surprises, and it's a big thrill and a big privilege. Every day looks different. Thank you so much, Amit Ram, for this interview. For four weekends this winter, Jerusalem is putting on a series of special activities covering all points in the cultural spectrum. It is an opportunity to get familiar with the city's nightlife, culture, and art. With us here is Sharon Oxman, Cultural Events Manager uh, at the Jerusalem's Development Authority. Thank you for uh, joining us. Tell us a bit about the concept of the festival, why in the winter, which is so cold here in Jerusalem, comparing to other places around Israel. Hello. So the concept of Hamsu Shalim Festival is to bring people from all around Israel and the world to have the opportunity to enjoy Jerusalem especially in the winter since we have this amazing winter that no one else in Israel has almost um, and give, give them the opportunity to enjoy the different aspects of culture that we have in, in Jerusalem if it's museums and theater and dance shows and different activities uh, outside indoors outdoors um, I think that we have such a variety here that really allows the people of all over the world to enjoy such a different activity, uh, especially for Jerusalem. And I have to ask you this, how is the spirit of the city itself, Jerusalem, being reflected in the festival's repertoire? So I think that the diversity of the festival is really showing the diversity of the city. We have here from events of religion to uh, Ethiopian music to jazz music and opera and really uh, modern dance activities and uh, activities for kids. And I think that the diversity here is really reflecting everything that Jerusalem has to offer for anyone from every, each, every age, every every uh, religion, every culture. I think this is amazing. Sharon, thank you so much for this. You're welcome. Thank you for focusing on Jerusalem with us. Before we say the final goodbye for the very last time, we want to wish you all happy holidays wherever you're at around the world.